to experience is a free worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 178 of Category 5 Technology TV. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Nice to see you. I'm it's, all right. It's Tuesday, the uh, 15th of February, 15th? 2011. Happy day after Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh. Indeed. <laughs> so, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Just checking our levels there. We just seemed a little bit quiet. There. We're ready to do a show now. Category 5.tv. Was it you? It was me. Oh. I re see him reach down and turn on his microphone. Shh. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Nice to have you here. Uh, tonight we've got a, that uh, chance for you to win a copy of Wirecast 4. Absolutely free, so uh, stick around. We're going to be telling you how you can win that. Uh, also, uh, we're going to be learning how to create mosaic images from your photographs. That's kind of a cool thing. Cool. So, and if you're not familiar with mosaics, it's like the tiles. So we don't get got, to play with little tiles. And yeah, we're going to actually do some cut and paste tonight. We're gonna, we've got our paper here and a couple of pairs of scissors, and we're just going to start cutting up photographs. Super. And we're not really going to do that, oh, no. but we are going to use some free software that's available on Linux only. So, uh, and that's uh, that's really where we're at tonight. We got lots of viewer questions, and uh, and mm -hmm. I realize tonight as I'm getting ready for the show that. Uh, that we want to try to get through as many of your questions as is possible. What? What's up? I was getting a little flack for trying to turn off the wireless on my phone just as we got yeah. started. Somebody caught me. He was doing well. Thanks, Jock. He was actually turning it off. Yeah. Well, Not I turned tweeting. The wireless off. We know he wasn't tweeting. Hey. What? I sent out a tweet or two. Did you? Not many. You're right. Not as many. Not as many as you could. No, not as many. Especially as when some. you've got a BlackBerry torch here. You could be, uh, you could be, you know. I could be tweeting. as annoying as the rest of us. I'm you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting on the bus. I don't have anything I'm to say. I down think the street. I'll tweet. I'm standing still. I don't tweet yeah. like that. Most of my tweets are reasonably interesting. Yes, you know, yes, indeed they are. Twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson, and uh, you'd be able to find out if my tweets are up to Eric's standards. <laughs> Okay, okay, hey. Yeah, I'm going to try to behave myself tonight. The cameras are on. We're in HD, aren't we, Robbie? We are, sir. I should probably have uh, <laughs> spent more time in makeup. All right. I had to, uh, I actually upgraded my razor this week because of the fact that, hey, we're HD. No, that's not really why I did it. But hey, you know, it makes for a good story, right? So. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe I could borrow it. Sure. No, not likely. No, not likely. Okay. <laughs> Well, are we having fun, John? We sure are. Let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, what's coming up in the news, shall we? All right. Greetings, everyone. Coming up in the newsroom this episode, a new cheap version of the Apple iPhone is in the works. A major Windows Phone 7 upgrade will offer mobile users IE9 and cloud support. Guitar Hero is being axed by the company that publishes it after nearly six years. And global data storage has been calculated at 295 exabytes. Stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah, look at these notes. Hey, 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 Hillary hey, hey. Had, uh, last week was talking about Reuters. And uh, the, the, you, you've heard me talking about Eric's attention to detail. <laughs> these are my personal notes. These are your notes. My notes are like important show stuff. Like today, we're going to be giving away a copy of Wirecast 4. That's, that's an important note. Okay, my first note last week was, am I reading the news tonight? Because I didn't see Hillary Sure, sure, anywhere, sure. But and what's your second note? Well, that's over, yeah, okay, so. John? <laughs> this, is, this is what we're putting up with here, guys. This is when Hillary's doing the news, and this is the note that uh, I, I that wasn't going to say anything about her saying Reuters. It's fine, it's fine. There you go. So just in case you were wondering, this is what Eric's writing during the news. <laughs> Thanks, buddy, for all your input. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. We let him away with a lot. The anal retentive sidekick, I guess, is what I am. I, I may start my own show. <laughs> Can you say anal on the air? 
<laughs> there you go. That's how he does things. It's a medical show. <laughs> oh, medical. my goodness. Yeah, it's medical. We're going to talk Freud. <laughs> Perhaps not. Okay. Oh, dear me. I need to take a taxi to get over here tonight. Thank you, know? you so for be, that. Be sir. nice to me. Yeah. Okay, you got some questions there? We'll hop into... I have uh, lots of questions. Like, Good, good. Why are we here? No, no, that's... <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a bigger question than you can imagine. Okay, well, we have one here. It's from, I'm going to go with Fiha. Hey, Fiha. Uh, Femi. Femi, okay. The email is, okay. Hi, Robbie. Hope everything is okay with you. I'm preparing my home video studio for podcast and some live streaming. Okay. As for now, I own a license of, looks like uh, vidblaster.com. Yeah, Fid Blaster. Um, I like this more than the other one, and it's uh, cheaper, offering HD streaming, good video switching effects, etc. I've ordered HD Pro web Webcam C910. One may be later. You may buy one more. Okay. Okay. So like an HD webcam? Yeah. Sure. And his <coughs> podcast microphone is uh, from bluemic.com Yeti. Those are good, yeah. And owns a license for Pinnacle Studio 14 Ultimate Plus Effects and Corel Video Studio Pro X3. Uh, we'll check which is better. Also running MacBook Pro 13 inch dual boot boot camp, Windows 7, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs uh, hard drive, and 2.4 gigahertz Intel dual core. Is there any tips how to have? your own live video streaming server that I could push uh, from home without going to uh, Ustream, etc. Hmm. Regards, Femi. How much bandwidth do you have, my friend? And it sounds like you're getting into some a pretty good setup there. Yeah. Um, and I shopped around, when I was shopping around for stuff, I looked at some of those products as well. As you know, we're using Wirecast here and just absolutely love it. I've never regretted that decision. That's That's been fantastic for us. Uh, and that's you know one of the reasons that you hear us uh, talking about it these days is because it's such a great piece of software. Uh, but the stuff that you're uh, that you're going with should be uh, should be good too. The, what I find, I'll just let you know, <clears throat> those uh, HD webcams because they're USB, they tend to be pretty heavy on the the CPU, and you're using the MacBook there, so it should be it should be pretty powerful as far as that goes. But just a heads up, once you start getting into one, two, three. HD USB webcams. All of a sudden, you'll find that the CPU time is not enough to keep up. So, uh, so just be mindful of that. That's why we use uh, a lot of external stuff going into capture cards instead, uh, because the uh, the overhead is a lot lighter. And that's also why uh, in the past we used uh, FireWire uh, on the SD cameras. But uh, and that's one of the reasons that we went with Wirecast as opposed as opposed to VidBlaster is because of the the better handling of uh, of the uh, FireWire as well. Uh, as far as streaming yourself, that gets to be pretty heavy on your bandwidth. I'll be honest with you. Uh, would love to know kind of what uh, what your thinking is, uh, like what along the lines, you know, where where you want to go. Maybe to get rid of advertising that you see on on Justin and stuff like that. Truth be told, the reason that we use things like Justin.tv and UStream, the reason that a lot of broadcasters are using those services, is because they have a lot of bandwidth to spare and they're able to provide a massive amount of bandwidth with only one upstream to their servers. So for example right now I'm streaming 926 kilobits per second and Eric can see that. Um, so at 926 kilobits a second that is my requirement to send to the servers. So if I were to host the stream here on our internal server for example I would have to take 900, and uh, it's spiking up to as high as 982 kilobits a second. I would have to have as many, uh, so if I had 10 people uh, watching, it would be 10 times that amount of bandwidth. And that's only for 10 people. So we're talking now, we're up to nine, almost nine megabytes uh, per second, nine megabits per second, I should say, um, which not a lot of people have. You're talking, that's fire, uh, fiber optics. Um, if you want to have, you know, say 50 viewers, you're talking 50 times the amount of bandwidth. So the advantages uh, to using something like Justin.tv or Ustream far outweigh the cost and the um, and the limitations of ho hosting it yourself. 
that said, because you're asking, I'll, I'll say uh, one of the most common ways to do it is through Flash, like we're using here, uh, for the live stream. And the reason that we use Flash is because it's probably, even though a lot, you know, a lot of people aren't too keen on Flash these days, the fact is, is for live streaming, it's probably one of the better options as far as quality to low bandwidth uh, ratio. And quite frankly, pretty much anybody who wants to watch uh, live video has the ability to do so and if they don't like for example through the iPod uh, touch or iPhone uh, or the iPad where they can't actually watch flash there are apps that you can install that will allow you to use uh, like uh, justin.tv and Ustream so that's one option is flash media server um, that's that would be something that you could install costs uh, start at about a thousand dollars for a license um, so not the best option as far as um, cheapness goes. Uh, from there, there's Wowza, which is about the same price if you want to get into a commercial license. Pardon me, but they do have um, what's called a, I believe it's called a developer license, which is free, but I think it's limited to something like 10 simultaneous connections for the video stream. So it's, it is quite limited. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the Windows end of things. You could, instead of going with Flash, you could go with uh, WMS, uh, Windows Media Services. And that is free as long as you have uh, Windows Server. So they say it's free, like it's a free download, but because you have to have a Windows Server, it, uh, it's really not that free. Which, as we know, is not free. It's very expensive to get that operating system. <coughs> if you already have a Windows Server, you're golden, as long as you can dedicate it to, uh, to that uh, product. So those would be the three that I would say look into. Uh, but again, I don't think any of those are the best option for a startup broadcast. I would get started with a uh, third-party option such as Ustream or Justin.tv. And then if you really want to get into spending money, I would go with a cloud-based solution, something else that uh, you know doesn't have the advertising but still allows you to tap into their bandwidth so that you're not having to uh, up and up and up your own bandwidth, which could get very, very expensive. All right. So I hope that answers your question, Femi. Uh, let us know. Uh, that would be cool. All right. Cheers. Let's see. Uh, Cal Hydro in the, uh, the chat room is wondering about installing LibreOffice. It doesn't show up in Ubuntu 10.10 .10 software store. No, because in, in Ubuntu 10.10, .10, it's still... Wow. All right. You can hear that, right? Hark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the, foot, the footsteps. Here comes Becca. Um, LibreOffice is basically like a, a fork of OpenOffice. So being that OpenOffice is in the 10.04 and 10.10 .10 of Ubuntu, you're not likely going to see that there. Uh, you'll probably see that in 11.04. But you can download it off of their website. My goodness, they can hear it in Texas. LibreOffice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Greg in Texas <laughs> says. <laughs> Indeed. LibreOffice.org. Download. They probably have. They may even have a repository that you can get it directly from uh, apt. Download the source. Uh, there's tar files. Let's see. There are deb files. So that's so that's probably the way that you're going to have to do it for now. I haven't. Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't installed it myself. Uh, I'm just using whatever is comes pre-installed, which in my case is OpenOffice at this point. It was heard in Christchurch, New Zealand, too. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, my goodness. I love my family. Hey. I love the kids. They're brilliant. They're healthy. They are. And I was going to say happy. <laughs> that didn't healthy. really sound happy. That didn't sound too healthy. <laughs> too happy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh. Texas says that's one loud kid. <laughs> okay, let's get you're, back. You're to some hearing other it questions. secondhand through a directional <laughs> microphone. Should have heard it from our perspective. <laughs> Still got the twitch. <laughs> All right. So, well, here's a question from Dennis, and hey Dennis. he's um, running Lucid. I guess I wasn't clear in my email about cloning a virtual drive and using it as the virtual disk on another virtual machine. That's right. We, oh, were, yeah, we, were we weren't completely on sure on sure. what the question was. Okay. Here's what I'm trying to do. Using VirtualBox, I created a Linux virtual machine and virtual hard drive. I installed the mini version of Ubuntu 10.04 and set it up with the software I wanted. 
I want to create a number of different Linux virtual machines set up exactly like the first one to do different things using clones of the first virtual disk that I've already set up. When I copy the first .vdi to a second .vdi and use VBox Manage? Uh, VBox Manage? Could be Manage. Okay. We're, okay. I'd like to buy a, a vowel <laughs> to change the UUID. It works fine in the original Linux virtual machine. When I release okay. it from the original virtual machine and attach it to any of the subsequent Linux virtual machines, everything works except the network. The network settings are the same on all virtual machines. How do I get the network to work? You mentioned something about this on the episode about changing the UUID with uh, VBox Manage, but didn't go into how to fix it. Hmm. Dennis. Now, I, I, I am not sure what I might have mentioned at that point, but you're right in, in that if you copy a virtual box hard drive, you have to change the UUID because it, it basically is like a, it's a virtual hard drive. So you, if you had um, two different hard drives and they both have the same UUID, which is the unique identifier, um, it's not going to work because the, it's like the same hard drive. Right? So he's changing them, so that's the right track. But why the network but, isn't but working? One isn't on at the same time as the other, is it? That's what I'm thinking. So it's, it's probably not like you happening. need a new SID or something because there's a conflict on the network. This is what I'm thinking. Uh, but is that they must be running at the same but time? But if they're only yeah, but if they're running uniquely, it shouldn't. I mean. Well, it depends. Do you have a DHCP server? Because what about your MAC address? That's possible. Your host name may be trying to. I don't know. You so want to you want to do basic networking. Yeah. You need to first of all. I'm I'm curious, uh, Dennis, if if the computers, the virtual computers, are both on at the same time. If that's the case, even with the separate UUID, probably have the same you need host an name. ID. Yeah, and uh, that can be determined. Just type host name at uh, at the prompt, uh, like terminal. Um, now a little program like New SID or something like that would that work on a virtual? Well, it's just Linux. Right, so you can just so. change the host name on on the Linux box, is is necessary. But I wonder also about your MAC address. Depending on when you say you're cloning the hard drive, I'm not. I guess it would depend on whether or not we're actually trying to run the same computer, virtual computer, or if it's just the hard drive. I, I'm going to bring bring up uh, VirtualBox here real quick and just right click on one of my machines. And if I go to Network. I mentioned this last week that you need to make sure that it's set to bridged if you want to be able to um, access the, the network properly or have the network access you. So do double check on that. Under advanced, you're going to see that it is, you know, what type of network adapter, but then also the MAC address. Uh, if you're actually cloning this computer, you may need to change the MAC address to match the original virtual machine. That's just a virtual MAC address of the network interface. Um, it's so tough to tell though really if they're running simultaneously make sure you change the host name on one of them uh, what else could it be any suggestions in the ch pardon me in the chat room mm. just trying to think and I'm sure you've done some troubleshooting sounds like uh, you you pretty much know your way through it all but with network going down it's got to be that either the virtual hardware or the configuration of your network itself, because if it's bridged, your DHCP server is going to see each virtual machine as its own physical hardware. So if they both are sharing the same host name, it's going to be like having two computers with the same host name on the network. It just won't work. Um, or if you're using static IP addresses, for example, within the virtual machine, uh, you'll get IP address conflicts if you try to boot multiple systems at the same time. And the MAC address is the only other thing I can think of. Changing that. Hmm. So where's the is the MAC address generated? It's automatically generated when you create the virtual machine. MAC address being uh, like every network device mm -hmm. has a MAC address. So your network card in a physical computer has a MAC I mean, address. Yeah, I'm just wondering virtually is there a there's a new one for each virtually, virtual machine? Virtually it creates a new virtual um, network card okay. which is unique to the virtual machine that you've created, not to the hard drive. Of that virtual machine, it's a it's the physical virtual network adapter. Did I say physical virtual? You did. The say virtual. That. <laughs> that was an oxymoron. It's kind of an intangible tangible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that where you? Yeah. I'll stop. <sighs> okay.
Okay. Did we get any answers? I. No, not. No. I I hope that one of those things is going to help you, Dennis. I'm sorry. It's it's one of those. It's it kind of could be so many different things, but I I hope that we're steering you in the right direction. But do understand that your virtual machines appear to each other and to your network as if they were real computers as long as you're in bridged mode, not in NAT mode on that network interface. So if that's the case, keep in mind that normal limitations and, and rules for networking apply. Yeah. And that's where your DHCP server comes in, that's where your host names come in, your IP addresses come in. Uh, everything has to be configured correctly as if they were two physical computers. Yeah, actually, so, I mean, in the uh, Ubuntu system, you could have different virtual machines on... Yes. And because he's cloning but the But they're all drive, on at the same time, so it very well could be a an idea on the network kind of a conflict. Yeah, that's my yeah, thought. exactly. At the DHCP okay. level, like at, the, at your router I was thinking he was only using one at any specific time, maybe only interacting with one at any specific time, but right. if they're actually up and running in the background then there could be conflicts on the, the network. Definitely. All right. So hard to guess. So hard to guess. Here is another one from Dennis. Or D-Man. Hey, D-Man. Okay, Robbie, where do I start to learn about building a computer? I have a limited budget, don't we all? Oh, sorry, that wasn't in there. And need <laughs> to use some of other hardware that I have, but... Uh, other hardware that he has, but still able to upgrade when I can. I have low-sized IDE hard drives. NVIDIA GF8600 GTU, uh, it's PCI he thinks, has uh, decent cases, so he's just looking for motherboard and processors that I can upgrade to. I was thinking of a motherboard that can handle IDE and SATA, SATA, so I can upgrade to SATA as I get the money to upgrade. Hmm. Okay, well, so he says PCI I. I think I no, that was PCI. PCI? I, I think without oh, a space after the I. Oh, and the okay, I, I between see. Between the eyes, you read it right. You got a space between okay. the eyes, That's right? <laughs> so with those old I, IDE hard drives, yeah, you're smart to get into a scenario where you've got both the IDE and the SATA. I'll say SATA. Okay. You say that. Now, what about... Uh, sorry, I digress. I'll ask that question okay. after we're done with this question. So. All right. Yeah, uh, Anto is suggesting you go on YouTube and say how to build PCs. Um, but this, you know, this is a good resource here as well. Like, if you have specific questions, and that's cool. But it sounds like you, you kind of know your, you, where you're going with this. You go want upgradability. And, and check the specs of what other, whatever motherboard it is yeah. you're going to... And see what... Yeah. But because it's based on, okay, so we've got, we've got the hard drives, they're IDE. So it's got a decent case, so we've I'm assuming a, the power supply is going to handle whatever he throws in it. Yeah, that's important as well. You've got a, G, got a, a GPU there with uh, 8600 NVIDIA card. Yeah. Um, so really it's just, it's because your, your needs right now are so basic, it's looking forward. And I think you're already at that point where you realize that's important. You know that you want to be looking for something that has both IDE and SATA. That's wise. Um, you want something probably with two IDE channels because you're going to be running your hard drives off of IDE. You don't want to slave your, your optical drives off of that same, um, that same uh, channel on the IDE channel because it's going to slow down your hard drives and then you've got to get into slaving and stuff like that as well. But you could get an SATA um, optical drive as well and then just use the IDE channel for the hard drive, so that's fine too. Um, but if you have specific questions, ask in the chat room. Uh, there are a lot of people mentioning uh, in the chat room some of the things that you can, that you can do. Uh, as Eric was saying, make sure you've got a good enough uh, power supply. You want to make sure that you've got plenty of wattage to, to carry, uh, carry your stuff and uh, like whatever peripherals you're putting in there. Um, your, your needs are probably pretty basic, so uh, even like a, a 450, 500 watt uh, power supply will probably do you well. But stay away from the really dirt cheap ones because they tend to, uh, you know, if they fail, they take everything with them, and you don't want that to happen. Um, so something a little bit uh, better quality. So. All right. Does that help? I don't know. I think that was Just, pretty helpful. All right. Had a question in the chat room wondering about a, a good external drive for uh, video storage. For video storage? Is that what... Uh, like just to yeah. put the video on and plug it into your pogo plug kind of thing. Yeah. Depends. Uh, okay, so depending on what you want to do, 
it really depends on whether this is going to be for um, redundancy or if it's going to be for multimedia or if it's going to be your only copy. If it's going to be your only copy, then I'm going to recommend that you get something that has a RAID 1 type unit. Um, there are many different kind of external chassis that you can get that you buy two hard drives and you pop those in and uh, even in some cases you'll have three hard drives and you've got redundancy. Um, don't fall for the for seeing that the, you know if a if a unit has two drives, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a RAID one. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll put two drives in it, and there'll be two 500 gig drives, and they'll call it a one gig uh, one terabyte external unit. So what they're actually doing is they're they're striping or spanning from one drive to the next, and uh, you're not actually getting any redundancy. What you want is redundancy there. Um, that's if you're going to be storing your stuff on there. If it's just for, you know, to be able to view multimedia files and you've already got a copy elsewhere, um, then you're fine to just get a cheap, you know, external hard drive, plug it into your USB, and then take it around to any device. But if it's your one copy, if this is your family videos and everything else that's, that's precious to you, keep it on something with redundancy in the drive, and then also have a backup of that unit as well. And that could be to your computer, to a server, to another device that you keep in a, in a locker somewhere. Um, just make sure you always have redundancy, and that's important. But these days, I think, you know, with USB 2 and USB 3 now, and uh, ESATA is another good option for you at 3 gigabits a second, the speed of those devices have become quite, quite a bit faster than they used to be. So if you've got the option of ESATA or USB 3, then those are your fastest options. Um, and below that would be FireWire and then USB 2, um, which these days you're not going to see anything less than that. So. Has some clarification on that question. It's uh, for USB video player. So. All right. So the external drive is for. Yeah. Playing. So any any drive, but keeping in mind that just like I said, if it's if it's going to be your only copy, there has to be, or if it's going to be the main copy, you need to have redundancy there, or at least have a secondary drive that you can keep you know at work or somewhere in a drawer that's uh, off-site I would always recommend I like because when I think about videos I'm thinking about the fact that I use a digital video camera and all of my family videos are on digital media and if I ever lost those it would be absolutely devastating so if that's you and if that's the case and you want to just be able to transfer these videos to your player by plugging in a USB cable it can be any device it can be any USB drive but you want to make sure that it's something that has redundancy so that if one drive fails, you've got a secondary drive. Um, and that, that would be the best way to go. You might pay a little bit extra for that, but it's worth it. Size-wise, it depends on how much, uh, how much data you're going to hold, but uh, a 500 gig drive will hold a lot of video. Uh, you consider that uh, you know, a standard home video at an hour uh, would, would be you know, maybe two gigabytes if... Um, if you had it in like a HD kind of quality, good quality, I think, give or take. Right. So, so you get a lot on something like that. A terabyte drive would be even bigger, but more apt to fail. Should point out that you know, although a RAID is great redundancy, and you're probably you know, if one drive goes down, you you're still going to have your files. But mm -hmm. it, it's not uh, it's not as good as having a backup. In it's a not the same somewhere. thing. Not it's even the same thing. Nowhere even close, because you know if that unit. These are things that complement each yeah. other. Yes. Right. Just thought I'd throw that. Yeah. In. No. Absolutely. It's a good I've point. I've seen that happen where, you know, the whole unit was toast. <laughs> yes. Because remember that this device, okay, if it's got two drives in it, it's not just a hard drive that could fail. What if the circuit board fails, and zaps both of the hard drives, and you lose everything? There has to be a backup of that drive, plain and simple. But. If it's going to be your main your main storage, have redundancy in that unit so that uh, so that you've got a little bit of extra protection. So no, if it's just stuff you've grabbed from some torrent somewhere, you know who cares? If you lose it, yeah, because the police are coming to your house exactly. anyway. You're, you're so make sure it's very portable so that you can flush it down the toilet very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's head over to the newsroom. And uh, see what's this, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something circling around the okay. There you go. All right, take it away. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, Bloomberg reports that Apple is developing a new lineup of smaller iPhones that it would sell to cellular telephone carriers for about half the price of the standard iPhone line. 
Because these new, cheap iPhones will be so inexpensive, the carriers could subsidize most or all of their customers' costs, bringing the iPhone into the price range of competitors' products. You may be surprised to find that Apple currently sells its iPhone devices to carriers for an average of about $625 each. The reason you're able to get them for much less is because carriers typically subsidize the price so customers can buy them for as low as $199 if they sign up for two years uh, for cell phone service. So carriers will be happier, users will be able to get an iPhone and get the functionality for cheaper, and Apple rejoices as they take over another demographic altogether, putting the iPhone in the hands of non-fan boys. Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer announced that a major Windows Phone 7 WP7 update coming later this year will add Internet Explorer 9, more third-party multitasking, Twitter, and SkyDrive cloud computing functions. Ballmer characterized the improvements as a way to please consumers, wireless carriers, WP7 developers, and even existing hardware makers such as Samsung and HTC in light of Microsoft's new partnership to put the Windows Phone OS on Nokia devices. The new capabilities will be um, a major Windows Phone release in the second half of 2011, although no date was given. A less significant update is due out in the first two weeks of March, which will add copy-paste functionality and application improvements. The popular music video game Guitar Hero is being axed by the company that publishes it after nearly six years. Activision Blizzard, which makes the Call of Duty and World of Warcraft series, says it's ditching the franchise because the popularity of the music-themed video games has faded. It's gone. The company is also cutting 500 people from its global workforce of 7,000. Activision Blizzard has revealed that other games are being cut, such as DJ Hero and True Crime. The company says music games are expensive to manufacture, between the licensing fees for the songs and the cost of making the hardware, such as plastic guitars and microphones. While gamers are sad to see Guitar Hero come to an end, bands will miss it as a platform to hugely increase the popularity of their music. Despite the end, Activision Blizzard will continue to sell and support its catalog of Guitar Hero titles. A study published in the Journal of Science, um, sorry, the Journal of Science earlier this month calculates the amount of data stored in the world to be in excess of 295 exabytes, which translates to roughly 295 billion gigabytes. Whoa! Scientists calculated the figure by estimating the amount of data held on 60 analog and digital technologies during the period from 1986 to 2007. They considered everything from computer hard drives to obsolete floppy disks and x-ray films to microchips on credit cards. Dr. Martin Hilbert of the University of Southern California told the BBC Science in Action, if we were to take all that information and store it in books, we could cover the entire area of the U.S. or China in 13 layers of books. According to the researchers, the same amount of information stored digitally on CDs would create a stack of disks that would reach beyond the moon. And amazingly, by 2007, 94% of stored information was kept digitally. So, keep a backup. You can get these full stories online at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our wonderful community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Thanks, so. No, I was saying <laughs> the mics are on. Like, like warning you that, hey, don't say anything crazy. The mics are on. Come on. Seriously. Have I ever? He mocks me off the air. Hey, nice to have you here. Now that I'm more comfortable, I may start doing it on the air. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is Category 5 Technology TV. Join us at Category5.tv. Be nice to have you there. This episode is brought to you in part by Pogoplug at www.pogoplug.com, as well as Planet Calypso. You can download the free game at www.cat5.tv slash Calypso. They're calling you crazy in the chat room. Right? No, no. They were telling me that I think there's a groundswell of support for me to get crazy. Oh, yeah. is that what it's all about? That'll be the after show. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll try to behave, Robbie, but sure. no promises. Speaking of getting crazy, you ever drop your cell phone or your mobile device? I know you have. I'm I, just, that's a rhetorical question. Not only did I drop it, I was stepping <laughs> out of a truck. Oh, I, I dropped, dropped my phone. Dropped I better go it. get it. Why don't I stomp on it? Yeah. Um, I, I 
well, viewers who have been watching the show for a while remember that my Sansa Fuse got dropped in a puddle. That kind of thing is devastating. That was like a couple of winters ago, dropped it, and couldn't believe. And <laughs> I was just talking to the young lady at the, uh, the wireless place where I got this. And, yeah. And I was saying, yeah, you know, I had a friend whose Blackberry couldn't swim. He says, mm -hmm. I was looking at somebody's today. And then he tells me after I've taken it, and, yeah, right. it fell in the toilet. <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> and says, okay. Well, we got we to gotta get some of these to, to him. Okay, these, these arrive. These are called ringer wraps. And these are, these are pretty cool. You can check them out at cleverwraps.com. There's nothing too incredibly fancy about them, except they're going to protect your mobile device should you get caught in rain, should you be sitting on, you know, on the boat and get splashed really badly or something along those lines. And they've got three different sizes, and each one is 10 bucks, and it's, there, there are five in a pack. So let's take a look at your, your device. You've got the Blackberry Torch. Yep. So we're going to go with the green package. This is right. small. I like green. There's also medium for vertical flip and slide phones. So this is like, you know, the kind that oh. open up like right. a like a well, old slide, Trek though, but not tricorder that. kind of thing. Okay. Or communicator. And then the uh, the large ones are more for, you know, the extra large the big smartphones. Android, uh, and, yeah, and the ones that uh, that have the sliding QWERTY keyboard and stuff where you really need that extra size. So let's check this out. Well, this has that sort of slide out feature. A little bit, eh? Let's see if this is going to fit as the small one on the on the Blackberry Torch. So slide that out. Yep. Looks right. good. So when you're canoeing? It's not really, it's not meant to be submergible, right? But what we've got is we've got a zipper seal, kind of like a Ziploc baggie. Um, seems pretty good quality. It's it's um, watertight. And then it's also got like a uh, a little a sticky sticker, strip. Like a sticker strip that's going to seal it even further. Okay, so very cool. if you put that on your device with the with the logo at the back, just kind of see how that uh, how that feels. What, should I open it up? Or? And I've got my iPod Touch. Yeah, oh yeah, open up the bag. And uh oh. After this, I'm going to ask him to dunk it in a bottle of water. Not really. I wouldn't do that to you. Beer maybe, but oh. Oh, this is kind of a little snug going in. I think they're kind of meant to to be a little snug. Oh, there we you go. don't want them to be. There we go. You don't want it to be sliding around like crazy. No, true. Now you've put it that. Look at this. He's put the. You put the logo on the wrong you side said there. Put, I, I was, said put I was, the logo I, at the I back. I know you said that, but I was struggling trying to get it in. Oh, okay. He didn't notice that you, well, you couldn't see yet. your screen. <laughs> it's like this is weird. It has a logo right smack dab in the center of my screen. Well, okay. You can see what we see. It is uh, cleverwraps.com. It, it's really uh, pretty easy to do. I'm just making it look difficult. It's making it look really Sorry. Tough. Come on. Get in. Okay. There we go. Uh -huh. I just called somebody. Okay, okay. Uh, I just placed an emergency call. Oh. What? Have you ever done that with your phone <laughs> where it says place emergency call? They, don't, uh, they don't take kindly to it. You press it by accident and it goes directly to 911. All right. And if you hang up, they call you back. It's <laughs> sure. Okay, so, what are, so how does go. that look? That looks great. So it's just like a, a bag on your phone. So yeah, you can still actually. The you I don't can know if still you can actually show the while you're this, canoeing. I'm uh, not sure we want to. Let's find a. Let's unlock this. I'll come up with a sure. fun little picture. So it really is just like a watertight zipper bag. The ringer wraps. They're ten bucks. You get five of them. They're recyclable, so once you're done with it, just throw it in the recycling bin. It's all good to go. But I think, you know, if you're on the boat fishing or whatever, it's not its not meant to make your device waterproof. It's just like an added protection that if you do drop it in a puddle, it's not going to get yeah. destroyed instantly. It's, you've got a little bit of a chance to, to save the thing and dry it off before you open the bag kind of thing. I went up for sushi last week, and yes, indeed. <laughs> it wasn't above... Uh... So, yeah, you can do everything while it's in the bag. Now, can you flip it open and stuff, and does the touch screen still can, work? And a little bit of a challenge? No, I've got these... Uh, I don't know that I'm going to get this all the way open here. It's going to be... might have wanted to open it and then put it in. Let's see if well, I can... Well, you're meant to kind of be able to do it, so maybe well, if you slid it all the way to the other end or something. It's kind of... Is it no, tough? No, I just loaded something. I don't know all where right. to get... Pictures of sushi. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe if I had put it in open, because... As I'm pushing that, the, the bag... But you're never going to do that, though, are you? Probably not. I mean, no. it does have a touch. You've got to be able to kind of open it up. But I guess the torch is a little bit... You know, you slide it. 
open, yeah, right? Slides open like that. So something like quite the, easily, right? So, but it it also has a touch screen Let's and a touch use keyboard. Thicker there, just so you can see a little bit, but. Uh, I, I think it might work better with like an iPhone or an iPod Touch or an Android device that's just the touch screen. Yeah. Perhaps. But, uh, well, let's see. Actually, no, it fits. Perfect fit? It's perfect. And I can use my keyboard now. Which, yeah. Uh, and there's a real close up of uh, some surf clam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, okay. So, mm, anyway. Good. It was yummy. <laughs> Delicious. And as you can see, they can't see that when you turn no, it away. No, no, but I'm saying, oh, okay. you know, and that was only our first plate full. We, uh, a good friend Ian and I, uh, oh, that looks do, good. do ourselves looks proud when we go to the wow. all-you-can-eat sushi. <laughs> 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 so with the pouch on, does it uh, actually feel I'm, pretty well, I've, okay? I use fingernails for uh, guitar picking, so I'm scared about maybe uh, Poke, punch poking, hole, yeah, poking yeah. the bag, but it, it seems fine. Seems They seem pretty seems thick, pretty though. good, actually. seem pretty thick. Well, you can check them out. I'll uh, I'll give uh, you'll take a pack of these and see maybe over the next couple of weeks if yeah. they if they seem usable and I think certainly uh, th now there's some demonstrations on their website and stuff and it just makes sense to like protect your device from sand and sunscreen right and stuff I mean like there's certain places you do this I don't definitely. think just on going, vacation you know not for a all car the time drive, ride and, and to the office you no probably wouldn't but if you're going on a jog or something and you and they're calling for rain That's for goodness sake there's a there's a chance for you to protect your device and still be able to text as you run into a water fountain. Because even if you have warranty on these things, not against water. <laughs> they they fall upon Oh, she could have saved her phone if she was using a ringer wrap. <laughs> ringer wraps are available from cleverwraps.com. Here, you take that, because that looks like about the right size. That does. And uh, let me know over the next couple weeks. Let uh, let okay. the viewers know if it's uh, Well, maybe I'll go good. camping this weekend. No. <laughs> Ten bucks gives you five. Good deal. Very cool. Cool. We are learning about uh, creating mosaic images tonight. The first mosaic that I ever saw was the Truman Show poster. Do you remember that? You remember the Truman Show? Oh, okay. Where Jim the actual Carrey. picture is made up of a pile of little pictures. It was a big picture of Jim Carrey playing Truman. Yeah. And within that picture, if you go close to the movie poster, you realize that it's not a photograph per se, it's actually thousands of little itty bitty photos of scenes from the movie, basically meant to depict yeah. this guy's life. Uh, and that was the first time I ever saw such a, a good example of a mosaic image and thought, wow, that's the coolest thing. Um, so I set out um, many years later and I created, um, and, I, and I don't know who owns the rights to the photos, but I, I did just for, just for family and friends kind of thing, create this image from um, a whole bunch of images. This oh, really? is obviously a bald eagle, but what I did is I got a free repository that had pictures of birds. And it had thousands of pictures of birds. And from those pictures, I created this mosaic. Actually, I created it for my father-in-law as a, as a way to make him accept me into the family. Well, son. <laughs> Did it work? Well, it worked. He's, he's, he's got it hanging up in his, in his office. But uh, So I, I made that. And, and I remember, and, and Becca was talking to me about it tonight. She's like, do you remember how long that took to make? It took forever. Because we didn't have any cool software tools back when I was trying to woo my father-in-law. <laughs> so it took a lot and a lot of work. But tonight I want to show you a tool that is free to install on your Linux computer and is going to give you basically that same ability as what I did there. Uh, you're going to find it actually in the repositories in Ubuntu and you'll probably find it in uh, pretty much any Linux uh, distribution. I'm going to go into Synaptic Package Manager and uh, once that comes up I'm just going to do a quick search for Pixelize, spelt just like that, and you'll see that here it is, create an image consisting of many small images. I'm going to mark that for installation, let that go, and very, very quickly I'm going to have that application installed on my computer here. So it's downloading it through the internet, that's how repositories work on Linux, and it's done, it's installed, ready to go. So tonight as I, as I was preparing for the, uh, the feature, <coughs> I thought, okay, well where am I going to come up with thousands of images? Because, you know, it took 4,000 images to put together that bird picture. 
Wow. Right. So where am I going to come up with images that I can use that are royalty free? So I said, well, I got screenshots. Oh my. Lots and lots of screenshots. You do, and some of them are more lovely than others. <laughs> so this directory, as it loads here, I think has, I don't know, something like 3,000 different screenshots. And this is the thing when you're making a mosaic, is understanding that the software needs to essentially replace any pixels of the photograph with similarly colored pixels from your actual photos that you want to comprise the photo of. So if your photo has a lot of red in it, and none of the photos that you're going to comprise the image of have red, all of a sudden you've got a problem where it's not going to be able to color match because you don't have any red photos. So that said, having at least a thousand photos is always a good idea um, for, for a, a reasonably sized uh, mosaic. And the reason for that is because then you're going to get a lot of colors, you're going to have a lot, uh, you're going to be able to basically work a lot of photos into the, the picture. So these are just straight screenshots from the show. First thing I'm going to do is get rid of just the black title sequence uh, at the beginning of each show. They may come in handy. Well, but I want it to be, I want it to be all photos, right? Okay. Here's a bunch that are basically from the intro video. So I'm going to get rid of those. I'll leave the Wirecast logo, that's fine. So I'm just deleting those. And then scrolling down here, I have literally thousands of photos from the show. I'm going to get rid of these, you know, thank you for watching Category 5 TV. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now all that's really left is, you know, photos from the show, screenshots, um, different applications loaded on the, the demo computer. There's a ton of stuff to work with there to create a mosaic. First thing that we have to do, though, is we need to create a database of all these photos in order to be able to use them with Pixelize. So I'm actually going to bring up Terminal. I'll switch over to, uh, to my computer here and bring up the Terminal. And what you want to do is go over to the folder where those photos are all located. So in my case, I've placed it in desktop slash images in my home folder. If I do an LS, you'll see all the purple there. It's hard to see on the screen, I know. but because of the transparency, but they are all there. So what I need to do is I need to use a tool that is included. Now that we've installed Pixelize, we've got this make db, and I'm going to go star, because everything that's in this folder is a JPEG. That's fine. So you could go star.jpg, whatever. I'm just going to go star, because nothing else is in here but photos. Do you need to tell it what fields to? This is actually just creating a database of all those photographs. Just name? So uh, essentially, yeah. So that when the program goes to load all the photos, it knows what photos okay. it's allowed to use, right? So that's going to go through. It's uh, likely going to take a few moments because we're we're talking about a, a few thousand images. We're up to 250 there. So that's pretty cool. While we're waiting for that, you're going to see gonna, at the bottom of the show to be continued. <laughs> well, I sure hope not. <laughs> okay. So while that's happening, okay. So that's happening on my screen here. I'm going to actually bring up a photograph here that I've placed on my desktop. This is actually one of those screenshots. And I said, OK, well, there's a nice photo of oh, great. Robbie and Eric. Okay, So I'm going to actually open that in the GIMP. Because keep in mind that the show is 854 by 480 in this case. So I want to, I want to make that a lot bigger. Keeping in mind that as you stretch an image, obviously, it's going to pixelize. But what we're doing is we're replacing pixels with individual images. So in this case, because we're creating a mosaic, we can actually upscale without losing quality because we're actually replacing pixel by pixel. So I'm going to go image, scale image. It's 854 by 480. So you know, if, if I wanted to fit 100, pic 100 pictures uh, horizontally into that, each one's going to be so small, I'm not even going to be able to see it. So I'm going to get a little bit crazy with it and go 10,000 pixels. I'm going to change my interpolation to sync and scale it. It's warning me that I'm creating a 500 megabyte file, and I'm OK with that. That is a big one. Yeah. So that's going to scale that to be a, a massively huge file. And again, this is still working those images into a database. We're so, at uh, 1,400 of them. Yeah. So we've got lots and lots of photos to work with. 
and uh, we're going to take all of those. We're going to take those few thousand photos and comprise this big photo here. That one there is actually going to be made up of all of those little screenshots. So we're going to see how this how this turns out. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and we're online at www.category5.tv. Nice to have you here. I'd encourage you to, to uh, submit a viewer testimonial this week. Uh, if something that we've said on the show has helped you out, or if you want to just say, hey, uh, you can do that right on our website by clicking on Interact, and uh, you'll see the viewer testimonials there, and submit your own. It'll be a fun thing to do. Jot wants me to do a whole show just letting that list scroll through the hey. images. And we could play some psychedelic music in the back. Yeah. Da, da. It's actually going pretty good. We're up to 2,100. And I don't know what the actual count is. I'd say, you know, two, 3,000 or so. But that's actually... Now, you'll see that while I've been waiting for that, the GIMP has completed resizing my image. Is there anything like this for Windows 7? Well, we're not looking at any Windows solution tonight. I know that there are. Okay. But we're going to encourage people to use Linux today. Okay, well, I just had one of my friends in the chat room ask yeah. that question. So. Just download Ubuntu or another flavor of Linux, and you'll get it for free. There's my nose at 10,000 pixels. <coughs> There's Eric's eyes. So this is massive, right? I look huge, like uh, huge. I may have been half asleep. We were talking. We were talking. Okay, we're up to 2,700. And we can do this reasonably quickly, um, and you can take more time at home to, to really tweak things and, and you know, make sure that your pictures are, are the ones that you want. There we go, 2,868 photos, and, and we're through that database. So there's a trick here, and that is, now I'm going to save that image. It's huge. Okay. If you go to Applications, Graphics, Pixelize, okay, you're actually going to have some trouble because there's no way within the application to tell it where this database that we just created is. Oh, Strange thing. But what we want to do is actually from within this terminal window, because we're already in the folder that now contains the database, you'll see there's pickdb.dat, right? So now <laughs> within this, uh, this folder, I'm going to go pixelize. And that's launching the application within this folder and automatically loading the database. All right. So now I'm going to, I think the GIMP has finished doing that, so I'm good. I'm going to close the GIMP. And now on my desktop, I've got this massive file. I'm going to open that in Pixelize. Again, this file open, real straightforward. It's on my desktop, and it's that file there. And once that brings that in, there it is. OK. So same as you saw before, it's a massive, massive image. Okay, but we're going to now turn that into a mosaic. So you'll notice that the size of images down at the bottom there, if my uh, dock bar can get out of the way, underneath you can see that the size of the images is 25 by 25. That is the actual size that each individual image in the mosaic is going to be. Keeping in mind that the show is widescreen, 25 by 25 means it's going to squish them. If you're using your digital camera to take these photos, you don't need to go through and crop each one, but you don't want it to squish. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you enter the correct proportions for, for those images, because you don't want them to be squished. You want them to be, in my case, widescreen. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm just going to open any one of these photos, because they're all the same dimensions, 854 by 4, uh, 480, I believe. I'm just going to open it in the GIMP. I'm going to right click and go Image scale image, and I'm going to pick a size. Let's say I want it to be, uh, I don't know, 45 pixels wide. Okay. Then this shows me that that should also now be 25 pixels high. All right. Guess. Well, that's just showing me oh. proportionally, because this chain link is here, that that image, if I wanted it to be 45 pixels wide, it would also be 25 pixels high. So. If I go to my image here and go Options, Options, I want to go, what did I say, 45, 45 by 25? 25, yep. Okay, so I actually enter 45 there and hit Enter. And you'll see that that's going to fit 223 wide and 225 high, give or take. Okay, so now I can dismiss that dialog. You'll see that the 
if I bring back up options, it has saved that setting, even though it hasn't reflected down at the bottom. And I'm going to go Options, Render, and it's going to actually create the mosaic based on those proportions. So this should be proportional to a widescreen image. Like the, those images are going to remain okay. widescreen. They're not going to get squished or stretched out of proportion or anything like that. And this is step one. We want to run it once, see if 45 pixels is about what we want. Because you want them to be big enough that you can see the image clearly, so that when you zoom in on the picture, when you stand up to it, if you print it, yeah. you can actually <coughs> see the individual images. But you want them to be small enough that if you're standing back, it actually looks like just a photograph and you, and you don't get the impression that it's made up of a bunch of little pictures until you get closer. So this is, uh, this is progressing. It's at about 55%. And, uh, and you can follow along if you've got Linux. Uh, make sure you install this. It's called Pixelize. Uh, very cool application and, and makes it so speedy. Can't believe that we're able to do this with the last five minutes of the show. Wow. When, you know, we're at 75 seriously, already. Dad, that took a lot of work that uh, that was not done with this software. Gabriel says it's killed your CP. It absolutely has. <laughs> I'm working with a 10,000 pixel wide image. This is probably, you saw, it was 500 megs, something like that, it said. So. Yep. That's loading into memory on my old laptop here. So, but that's fine. It still works. It's not crashing or anything like that. It's just working away. It's at 100% now. It's placing all those uh, individual segments into the image. There we go. How cool is that? It looks pretty well. Yeah, there we go. Well, this is the close up of your nose. Right. I was right. thinking the whole picture. Right. But so now it's almost rendered. Wow. Okay. And here we go. Now that it's rendered, it's going to colorize. And there we are. So now quickly, I'm going to save this to my desktop. What I'm going to enter here is mosaic.ping. Uh, we want to ping because that's going to be a high quality image. And that's going to allow us to then take that and we can com we can size it. We can uh, scale it down, we can save it as a JPEG, we can do whatever we want, but our master image is going to be this great big high resolution, really good quality, lossless ping. That's Whoa. what we want. It's going to take a moment to save because it is a huge image. So the original file was going to be 500. The Maybe. original what, file what's going to happen was really small, pixels? remember, 854 by 480. So we scaled that up to 10,000 pixels wide, right. proportional. So it's going to be 500 That's right. at that point. Yeah. So now what we're will this end up being? We'll see. In that Bigger than that, I would think. Larger than that. Okay. Possibly. Because yeah. it is a ping. We're saving it in full mm -hmm. like full quality. Um, and here it goes. This will be right down to the wire. One oh, minute left of the have. show. Let's see how it goes. There we go. It's saved with one minute to spare. I'm going to close out of all this stuff. And let's check out our brand new mosaic saved on my desktop there. You can double click on that and bring it up. This is going to be pretty cool. I already think it's cool. Yeah. Even though all we got to see was your face. Well, there we go. So there's a picture there. that looks like a picture. It looks like it's a little bit black and white. Maybe we didn't have enough red for your shirt. But watch this. Let's, let's just take a look. Oh, nice lapel. That is amazing. There he is at Planet Calypso. Now these are all individual screenshots that you'll recognize from Category 5 TV. And this is, this is just my example, but imagine being able to take thousands of your home pictures and take a family portrait and turn it into this amazing masterpiece of family pictures. It's just absolutely awesome. This is called Pixelize. It's available for free on your Linux computer. Check it out. And only for your Linux computer. And only. <laughs> this is Category 5 Technology TV. It's been fantastic having you here this week. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you had fun. We'll see you next Tuesday night. All Take right. care. Have see a good you week. next Tuesday.